We have electrical systems in order to do work. That's the point, to harness the energy available in the electrical force for our benefit. In order to do that, we have to get electrical charges apart, so that when they run back together, the heat they generate or the magnetic field around them can be used to do work. It takes work to do that. Wait a minute, you say. If it takes work to create electricity, just so it can do work, why don't we just do the work and skip the electricity part? We must get more back than what we put in, right? Well, no we don't. Any of the processes used to create electrical energy require more work input than what we get out as useful work. And yes, for most of history, we just did the work because electricity wasn't around to do it for us. It's all about convenience and availability. You don't need to have a mixer to blend food ingredients. You could use a spoon. You don't need to use an elevator to move between floors of a building. There are stairs. You don't need to have a circular saw to cut wood. A handsaw does it. But we have these things because they make us able to work faster and more efficiently. That's what electricity does for us. Let's look at how we create potential difference, the pressure that enables current flow. When you pound a nail or open a door, you are performing the classical definition of work, the application of force through a distance. It also takes work to separate electrical charges. Although you may not think about it when you flip a light switch or turn on your computer, the separation of charge that enables electrical current to flow through those devices requires the application of force through a distance, considerable force. It requires several hundred thousand horsepower to drive the generator at a large power plant, just to separate electrical charges and maintain the pressure for current to flow. When you slide across a car seat and scrape off electrons, or when you walk across a carpet, work gets done. The natural balance of electrical charges in the atoms of the car seat or the carpet is disrupted. This is the creation of potential difference by friction. There are other ways. If you have a newer gas barbecue, it undoubtedly has flameless ignition. No pilot lights, just that little click-click sound when you press the knob. Know what that is? It's a piezoelectric device, which uses pressure to separate electric charges. In certain materials, the application of pressure will cause the positive and negative electrical charges in them to separate. What you're doing when you press the switch is squeezing a piezoelectric crystal, generating a voltage, and making a spark fly across a small gap. The effect is used for other purposes also, electric guitar pickups and pressure sensors, to name a couple. Not a big source of electrical generation, however. Here's another source. Take two wires made of different materials, say copper and iron. Twist them together at one end and hold that end over a flame. The electrical charges in the wires will separate and migrate to opposite ends, positives at one end and negatives at the other, in proportion to the amount of heat applied. Hmm, what good is that? Well, if you've got a gas furnace in your house, chances are the main gas valve is held open during normal operation by the action of a thermocouple. The pilot flame is heating the junction of two dissimilar metal wires, creating a difference in charge or voltage. If that voltage goes away, say because the pilot flame got blown out, the main valve would shut off, avoiding the possibility of your furnace blowing up. This is a good thing. Many devices also use thermocouples to measure temperature. Since the voltage created varies with the applied heat, you could set up a gauge that's measuring voltage but displaying temperature. And we do. And another thing. Have you ever wondered how space probes in the outer reaches of the solar system have electric power to run their equipment? Too far from the sun for solar cells, no way to charge batteries. Hmm, how about if we take a lump of radioactive material, which gives off heat, and implant two dissimilar metals in it? Voila! A radioisotope thermoelectric generator, like this one, used in the Cassini probe that explored the Saturn system. Try this. 
If you stick a copper wire and a paper clip into a lemon, you will measure almost one volt of electrical pressure between the two. What's happening? Well, the acid in the lemon is reacting with the zinc and dissolving positively charged elements off of it into solution, leaving the paper clip with an excess of negatively charged electrons. On the copper side, electrons are combining with hydrogen atoms in the acid and leaving the copper wire so it becomes positive. This is a chemically activated separation of charge, creating voltage between the two materials or electrodes as they're called. It's a very simple kind of battery. More common batteries use different materials and different chemical reactions, but the principle is the same. Another chemical reaction that separates charge occurs in a fuel cell. A hydrogen fuel cell like this one is a common type. In it, Hydrogen is fed to an area with a catalyst material that splits the electrons off the hydrogen atoms. Another area of the cell is fed oxygen from the air and contains negatively charged material that attracts the positive hydrogen. The areas are separated by a membrane that will only allow the hydrogen atoms to pass. The electrons take an alternate path through an external circuit and that is the electrical current flow that we use to power devices. The hydrogen atoms, electrons, and oxygen combine to produce water, the only exhaust of the fuel cell. The energy in light can also separate charges. Sunlight hits a panel of silicon-based cells and is absorbed by the semiconducting material. The energy knocks loose electrons, negatively charged, from their atoms, allowing them to flow through the material to produce moving charge. Because of the special construction of solar cells, the electrons are only allowed to move in a single direction. The complementary positive charges that are also created, like bubbles, are called holes and flow in a direction opposite to the electrons. So, as in all the other systems, work is done and charges are separated. So, we've covered the separation of charge by friction, pressure, heat, chemical reaction, and light. There's only one more, and it's the big one. If you wave a magnet across a wire made out of a conducting material with lots of loose electrons, like copper, the force of the magnetic field will move loose electrons through the wire, leaving positive charges behind. One end of the wire becomes negative, the other positive. The number of charges separated in this way depends on how strong the magnet is, how much wire is involved, and how fast you move the magnet. How much separation of charge would we get if we put thousands of feet of copper wire in a solid metal casing, inserted a large electromagnet in the middle, and spun it at 3600 revolutions per minute? Yeah, it's C. Large generators typically produce 20,000 volts or more of potential difference and large current flows. All generators whether powered by steam, water, or wind, use the idea of moving a magnetic field past a conductor to separate charges. The vast majority of electrical energy used in the world is generated this way. Energy from solar cells, batteries, and fuel cells is becoming more of a factor, but is still behind. In the U.S., less than 1% of our electrical demand is generated by solar cells. The rest comes from spinning a magnet inside a coil of wires. So, friction, pressure, heat, light, chemical action, and magnetism can all be used to separate charges, creating the electrical pressure, measured in volts, that enables current to flow. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.